Hey, everybody. I don't know. I'm pulling myself up to see if we're live. Yes, we are. Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We're back. I'm back with Dr. David Diamond of USF. Um, you know, after the luck we had the other day where I felt like a Neanderthal, literally, and I, <laughs> but, um, you know, technology can be a little uh, temperamental. So what can I say? I'm not really an expert. But anyway, I wanted to welcome everybody back um, to our live event. I'm just going to pull up my Facebook on the phone so we can see comments because we want you guys to comment. Okay, so here I go. Pulling us up. And we're live. Okay, so I want to introduce Dr. David Diamond. And he is a professor at, based at USF right now. Um, he's done a lot of different things, but one thing he has a, pro, a really personal interest in is heart health, statins, and really educating the public on the myths, the myths, excuse me, that are out there and what to tell your doctor if you decide or you think you want to go off of statins. Now, that being said, I would just like to say that neither David Diamond or myself, Jennifer Masson, are physicians or giving any kind of advice that you should take literally. You know, you always talk to your healthcare professional. Um, so this is the official disclaimer, just to put it out there that, uh, you know, we're just, these are our own opinions and we're having a little chat. And I, I like to say a fireside chat because literally I'm in my room with the fireplace in Florida that we never use. So I have to at least say it. So David, welcome back. Thank you so much for being so patient and joining me again, you know, after the, the, the event of the other day. Well, thank um, you for, for inviting me to chat. So, you know, just tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, you know, how did you get here? Like you are a professor, neuroscience, and here you are talking about heart disease. Okay, so you're right. I'm a professor of neuroscience. Um, I've actually been a neuroscientist now for 40 years. Um, got my PhD in biology. Uh, I've had a very long career, a still active career as a neuroscientist. But about 20 years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, sort of a genetic anomaly, which has a great benefit if it's a time of famine. Um, because I happen to be in about 1% of the population in which I'm extremely efficient at converting sugar into fat. Um, so when I eat sugar or have bread, and the anomaly is called uh, genetic uh, familial hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, so when I eat bread, um, I'm, I get a dramatic increase in my blood fat, triglycerides. I also gain weight very easily. And so 20 years ago, I was much heavier and I had extremely high triglycerides, typically about 10 times the average amount of triglycerides. So most people are below 100. If you know your triglycerides, you're probably below. Right. And the sort of danger level is if you're over 150, most healthy people without heart disease have triglycerides below 150, and definitely below 100. But 20 years ago, my triglycerides were about 800, and which wow. is really alarming to any doctor. It was alarming to me. I mean, it is a real concern. And my good cholesterol, which is called the HDL, was extremely low. And that combination actually put me at very high risk for heart disease. It was also damaging to the pancreas. My doctor wanted me to go on a statin. Um, I knew a lot about the brain, but I didn't know much about statins or heart disease. Okay. And I figured um, I'm not going to take medication. I could just beat this with a low fat diet. Went to the American Heart Association website and I exercised like crazy. So four or five days a week, I was exercising. 10 years later, I just got fatter and my triglycerides were still astronomically high. My doctor sat me down and said, the time has come. Exercise and diet have failed. You must go on a statin. He urged me to go on a statin as well as some other medications such as niacin. And he emphasized that I take fish oil. But I figured uh, I got a PhD in biology. The least I can do is read a few papers on this before I take the medication. And the first paper I read, so the biochemistry is straightforward. 
that triglycerides are fats that are formed by the liver from sugar, glucose, right. fructose. And once I read that, I realized the problem was that I thought I was safe eating bread without putting butter on it. But it was actually the bread and the sugar that was actually increasing my triglycerides. So I started reading about this. I read Gary Taub's books. I read some of Jeff Volokh's work. Um, and I read some other work on this and realized this had been the flaw in my life um, and my nutrition. So I cut back on carbohydrates. And I have to tell you, my doctor warned me. He said, you're taking a bad situation. You're making it worse by going on the Atkins diet. But I went forward anyway. And in the last 10 years, I've cut my triglycerides by 75%. I dropped them from about 750 now to below 150, which is considered a safe zone. Mm -hmm. uh, and all without medication, just by going low carb. So this is the research that I have learned about that shows that high triglycerides, low HDL, and the excess weight I had, it was all related to basically consuming too many carbohydrates. It wasn't related to fat. That's really incredible. Um, and that you did it through diet. You know, Dr. Diamond, what would you say you know, when the start of all this began, um, I know, you know, when I was young, uh, they had, it was a real emphasis on fat free, fat free, fat free, fat free. Um, and that was probably in, you know, in early 80s. And I don't know if you remember that woman with the real short crew cut hair. I don't know if I should say her name or not, but uh, of, stop the, the insanity. Oh, right. Stop the insanity. Okay. That's it, right. Yeah. It, in the 90s much as you want um, and not get fat and not gain, gain weight. And it was all about the carbs and fat free. Right. right? I agree um, on that message. Fat free, but also that eating cholesterol, which is eating any animal source of food ultimately is heart unhealthy. So right. I was also avoiding uh, red meat. I was avoiding eating animal products and I figured, you know, vegetable oil was safe. Mm -hmm. Animal fats were unsafe. That's what I grew up on. And that turns right. out. Right. And, and it almost doesn't make sense, though, because when you think about fat, natural fat that comes from an animal, right? If you were to have a piece of steak or something that a fatty piece of meat that people are shunning versus, you know, the uh, heart healthy, fake yellow spread that comes in a container in the grocery store that has been completely chemically produced. You know, I mean, logically, you would think, wow, the steak looks way better and it looks like it would be better for you. But no, this is what they're telling me. I need to eat this, you know, heart healthy spread. So um, but things I, I have to say, I believe things are changing. And I think that you have, a, you know, a big role in what's going on today, because I know you've been getting out there and educating the public. Um, and because of what happened with you, you know, and it, it's, it's such a personal message to you. Um, a, a question that I have is, you know, what do you suggest people say to, whether it's their family or their doctors or, or, or you know, when they, they don't want to take statins anymore or they don't feel they need to, they want to try it through diet. You know, what do they say? Well, first let's, let's back up to the diet because okay. When you look at animal fat, mm -hmm. saturated fat is solid at room temperature. And so I've had people say to me, you see, it's solid. And so therefore, it's going to solidify in your blood and it's going to block your arteries. Whereas vegetable oil is liquid and so it's fluid and it's good for you. And I always tell people just because something makes sense doesn't mean it's biologically accurate. <laughs> and I, I like that, uh, I think it's Tom Naughton who said, well, let's look at broccoli. Okay. <laughs> broccoli is solid at room temperature too, but it right. doesn't mean that it's going to block your arteries. So what people need to understand is just because something makes sense doesn't make it accurate. We got that message from really powerful people in the 1960s and 70s, Ansel Keys and then mm -hmm. the Harvard group, in which they were just completely wrong in demonizing saturated or animal fat and uh, and and saying vegetable oil was so good for you. So that's the first thing that I learned is we really have been misled as far as what kind of foods are healthy and unhealthy by, by frankly bad science. Keep in mind too, 
and I've been told this, people look at someone eating a cheeseburger and french fries and soda and ice cream, and these people are fat, you know, that's what they eat all the time, and, um, and they have heart disease. And what they do is they'll look at that meal and they'll point to the cheeseburger and they'll point specifically uh. to the meat and they'll say, that's why this person is fat and has heart disease. And my message has been, I just think this is a no brainer. You've got to look at the whole meal. When you eat animal fat along with sugar and excess bread, that is an unhealthy meal. Combination yeah. of fat and sugar is unhealthy. But if you eliminate the sugar, then you find actually the fat is no longer unhealthy. And that's the first thing people really need to understand. That's about diet. Right. So it's the sweet fat combination, right? It really is. I mean, sugar is the best tasting toxin that there is. Sugar is the, at the root of all health evils. Yeah. I also um, think fried foods in vegetable oil is incredibly unhealthy to eat um, because you're basically taking almost all vegetable oils are unhealthy. If it hasn't been squeezed out of a vegetable, it's really mm -hmm. unhealthy. So avocado and olive are good, but ones in which you derive them chemically, organically, which is yes. soybean and the other oils, safflower oil, in which you've got to use organics, or corn oil, in which you extract it chemically from the corn. Even canola, right? Because canola is not, I, I don't know, is there a canola fruit that there's, you get the canola from? There, there actually is no natural canola plant. Right something created but canola stands for canadian oil okay so canadians came up with this um, by genetically modifying food and so canola is actually kind of complicated because it's actually high in omega-3 fatty acids which we consider to be good so I'm, I'm not quite sure yet about demonizing canola as much as mm -hmm. i would other oils but i generally avoid it because i don't want any kind of organically extracted oil right you know, I think with the canola, uh, well, at least from my, my perspective, it's the smoke point, you know, because when people cook with it, um, it tends, the fat will oxidize at a lower temperature yeah. Yeah. versus, you know, the lard, tal beef tallow, avocado, even avocado oil, you know, with meaning a higher smoke point for all those people out there that are watching and don't know this when you're cooking and you see, you know, you put oil in the pan and then you start to see the smoke, that's when you're getting, the fats are changing and they're becoming oxidized, which is essentially right. forming free radicals and that's what's happening in your body. So you right. don't want that. That's a great point. One thing to realize yeah. with corn oil, it's oxidizing just by being exposed to the air. Right. And corn oil is so rapidly sensitive to oxygen that it goes rancid without heat. So when you add heat to corn oil, it goes extremely rancid. Now, if you go to the extreme, which is fried foods, deep fried foods, mm -hmm. which again is the best tasting toxin there is. French fries are absolutely the best. Um, but what you've got in French fries are potatoes, which not only have anti-nutrients, which are really bad for absorbing um, minerals such as magnesium, it's coated with this rancid oil that's really unhealthy. Uh, so we gotta realize though, you're absolutely right about the saturated fat because saturated animal fats and tropical oils don't go rancid when they're mm -hmm. heated uh, because they're so much more stable in response to heat. Um, so it's a great point that you raise about heat. Now, lightly sauteing is okay, especially for avocado or olive oil. Um, right, it depends on the temperature, you know, and that's-, that's yeah. Um, yeah, you did ask me, your original question was about statins. Oh, yes, 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 okay. Um, and that is what I've, I've actually, what's happened is because I've learned about this and uh, I'm invited to conferences to speak. I've been invited to cardiology conferences. I lecture to cardiologists. I give grand rounds lectures to physicians. And when I start talking about um, statins, they're amazed at what they didn't know. And so I'll just share you a little bit um, about the yes, statin. Yes, please. And, 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 and David, you know what I'd like you to touch on too specifically is the relative risk with those advertisements. So definitely we want to tell people about that. So Right. So this is what people are amazed at, including doctors. So when I first considered taking a statin, I didn't know about relative and absolute risk. I'll get into that. And my doctor and others said, well, if you take a statin, you're reducing your risk of having a heart attack by 50%. And when you hear that, you feel pretty good. You say, I almost feel immune. I'm going to be in that 50%. I won't have a heart attack. So these are real numbers 
that I've learned that I now share, and I've published in a medical journal about this, which I call deception. So it's a real numbers. You conduct a study on a statin, such as Crestor, Lipitor. If the name ends in statin, it means it's a statin, which is a drug that blocks the enzyme that produces cholesterol. So you end up with lower levels of cholesterol. So you give 100 people at risk for heart disease a statin, and after three years, what you find is that 99 of those people did not have a heart attack. And that's pretty good. Okay, so yep. yeah, that's great. If you now give 100 people uh, nothing, um, and it's a placebo, and what you find then is after three years, well, it's only, let me change this, after, after three years, 98 of the people do not have a heart attack. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. And you know what I'm going to ask you to do too is if at, at the end of this broadcast, uh, you know, we'll maybe if you'll take a couple of questions or, you know, if we have sure. time and put me, if there's a visual that you could right. put out so that would make it clear to people okay. because it's kind of hard. By the way, I, I got it back. Yeah. I got my numbers back. Okay, everybody, wipe that out. We're going to start over. 99 okay. of the people do not have a heart attack. 99% do not have a heart attack. Okay. Now, you give the people a placebo, which is an inert pill. At the end of three years, if you're looking at a 50% reduction, you figure 50 of the people are going to have a heart attack. Well, 98% of the people have a heart attack if they're just given a placebo. So if they're not given anything, the difference is only 1%. The difference between the people who are given a statin, 99% do not have a heart attack, the people who are not given anything, 98% do not have a heart attack. So the benefit, the actual benefit mm -hmm. is 1%. So now you ask, well, where is the 50% reduction in heart attacks by taking a statin? And so this is where they play the games because the real difference is 1%, but the difference between 2% of the people given a placebo have a heart attack versus only 1% of the people given a statin have a heart attack, that benefit is actually only 1%, but the difference from two to one is a 50% reduction. And this is yeah. the number that the drug companies use when they wanna convince people of a 50% reduction in the rate of heart attacks. But realize that the actual amazing. difference is only 1%. When I first heard you talk, your, speech, your, your talk about this, that I, I was just, blown away because they're allowed to do that. They're allowed to go out there and it's misleading because most of the people out there don't really fully get the statistics, you know, when it comes to that. And the little teeny tiny print will say, this is relative risk. Right. So that's what's called relative, absolute risk is what you really should care about. You go to your doctor mm -hmm. and say, what's the likelihood I will not have a heart attack if I take a statin versus not taking a statin. And that real difference is 1%, one out of 100. And that's after taking a statin for three years, there's one less heart attack in one person. Now, you can still say, well, that's better than nothing. And that's what I emphasize to people. Okay, there is this minuscule benefit, this 1%. You do get a slight benefit. Well, that benefit is offset by about a dozen different adverse effects that have been shown in the medical research. Two are the most obvious. A high percentage of people, ranges from five to 25% of the people develop muscle pain, serious muscle problems. It interferes with people's ability to exercise. They have less energy um, to really extreme forms in which there's muscle damage as a result of the statins. The mm -hmm. second, which is fully accepted by everybody, is that statins can cause diabetes in healthy people. Ah. And in one of the best studies I've seen, they found that after six years of people on statins, you find an additional five to 6% of people on statins develop type two diabetes compared to placebo, which more than offsets that 1% benefit. And in particular, the risk is so much greater for women. Women have a much larger rate of diabetes in response to taking statins than men. So statins ultimately are interfering with your insulin signaling, interfering with your pancreas from working properly. You have higher blood sugar, 
And therefore you're putting yourself actually at risk of developing more heart disease. Wow. And it's not like the environment today is, um, you know, it, it's, it's easy enough to be overweight and eat too much sugar and, and carbohydrates to, to, you know, lean towards diabetes than throwing statins on top of that. So like part of the problem is when you take a statin, you sort of feel immune to developing heart disease, you feel protected and you really feel like you can cheat more on your diet. Because even if I eat crappy food, I've got the statin protecting me from developing a heart attack. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm not going to say any names, but uh, so my husband, he's a physician. And you know what? He could not take statins. He had that muscle pain that you were talking about. Uh, I mean, really, really intolerant. Another physician colleague of his, when he was first, you know, talking about the cholesterol thing, told him to just take a statin and eat the donut. Right. So that's what the, and this was several years ago, but that's generally, I feel what the mentality was, you know, the thinking, the um, they're, they're not well reading, they're not diving in. When people go to the doctor and say, I've got muscle pain from taking the statin, the doctor can often, and I've heard this from many people will say, well, you have a choice. You can have some muscle pain or you can have a heart attack. Mm. So tolerate the muscle pain so the statin will protect you from a heart attack. Well, it's just simply not like that. You don't have really much protection from developing a heart attack. You know, the majority of people take statins who have not yet had a heart attack. It's called right. primary prevention. And so in general, there's, there's almost no benefit. It's not really even 1%. Overall, the real benefit from cardiovascular mortality is less than 1%. It's only about a half percent. And overall mortality, there's just really no benefit. So, okay. And so, so that's, you know, with the statins. And then as far as diet and, and the dietary changes that you've made going low carb, do you follow, you know, any particular type of diet? I, you said low carb. Are you, you know, specific as far as the number of carbohydrates that you allow yourself? Do you do more ketogenic diet? What is your plan? Well, it, it may very well have to do with my genetic anomaly, which makes me, I crave carbohydrates. And so this has actually taken me years sort of deal with that craving for carbohydrates. I've cut back slowly. And as I cut back, my triglycerides go lower. I'm probably at the point now where I'm, I would say I'm borderline ketogenic because I cut back so far on carbs. Um, I can say no to, to ice cream a lot more easily now. I can absolutely say no to French fries because I, I just know how harmful it is. It's taken years. I don't eat potato chips anymore. And I, I got to tell you, it's not easy giving up carbs. Um, but at this point, I've gotten my weight now um, a good bit lower. And, you know, weight loss alone, I want to emphasize weight loss alone is really not healthy. There are lots of ways to lose weight. If you cut calories, you can lose weight. Right. But weight Watchers, Jenny Craig approach, in which they say it's okay to eat bread, just count your calories. That is first, it is so difficult. And second, you have to cut back on fat to lose weight on that kind of approach. And ultimately that really isn't healthy to be cutting back on fat. So where I am now, where I've been on this sort of 10 year journey of mine, started a bit mm -hmm. over 10 years, um, is that I have cut back more and more on eating carbs. Um, and ultimately, you know what really matters is not just simply eating carbs, it's how does that food affect blood sugar? Yeah. So you can eat an apple Okay, and your actual blood sugar rise is very small. So it's got a small glycemic load. And I think that's worth looking into. So a low glycemic load means it's actually from the food you're eating, how much does your blood sugar rise? And it doesn't really rise much from apples or having some berries. But um, you have watermelon or banana. I mean, that's really like eating candy. And mm -hmm. so I avoid those fruits completely. So slowly over the years, I'm, I'm adapting to more dramatically cutting back on, on foods that I know make an increase in blood sugar. Um, no, that makes sense. Absolutely. Have you, okay. Have you ever tried fat bombs? Because if <laughs> not, I have a great recipe. <laughs> fat bombs. No, I've never heard of fat bombs. There, you know what, David? When people get cravings uh, for carbohydrates, and it happens, I, no matter who you are, um, I think women, you know, we tend to have a lot of hormonal things going on, uh, you know, and so, so that I know for me is an issue, but 
it's a little ball of energy, sort of like you would call it an energy ball, but instead of, you know, made, being made from dates and oats and all those kinds of things, it's made primarily from sources of fat. You could crush, you know, crushed nuts and coconut oil and grass-fed butter and things like that. And you put them, I put them in the freezer in a little silicone oh. tray. So then at night, you're like, oh my goodness, uh, where is this craving coming from? You can go in there pop one out of the ice cube tray and have it. I did uh, pecan pie fat bombs. Actually, they're pretty good. So I'll send it over to you. But great. So your nutritionist um, background has really helped. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's where that comes in, you know, so rather than having starting with that roller coaster and going up and down, I we try and explain to people, you don't want that, that insulin response. That's what we're looking at. That's right. right. And, Absolutely. And there are tools. There are other tools, but we're, we're just talking about diet and statins today. And um, the one thing I did want to ask you about was when you mentioned that um, enzyme that blocks the cholesterol production. I actually read, I was doing some research of my own. I mean, I'm looking at so many different studies. I can't tell you right now off the top of my head, but that same enzyme that's needed for cholesterol that statins block is also needed to generate ketones in your body. Well, that's, so, that's fascinating. Right, so the question is, if somebody were on a statin and wanted to get into ketosis naturally through diet alone, is that gonna, that could actually potentially impede them, their efforts. I mean, there's, I didn't see any research on that. So I don't know if you had heard or seen anything, you know, about that. So first, I need to look into that. I wasn't aware that the ketone production was in the same. Well, there is the series. HMG co-reductase, I think. Is the so I, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of any study that has looked at ketone production in people on statins. I think that's an important study. Right. But, you know, let's get back to ketogenic diet. Yeah. Uh, one thing people should realize is that if you eat a lot of protein, that could interfere with your ability to go into ketosis, which is to get uh, develop, uh, produce ketones. Um, I think it's helpful to being produced ketones. I think ketones are great for the brain. They're great for heart function, um, but it's difficult for most people to be in ketosis. It's a really extreme diet that requires almost no carbohydrates. You're looking at only typically 10 to 20 grams per day, which is almost nothing. And it also has to be a relatively low protein diet. So right. you really need to eat mostly fat. And that's difficult for most people. And frankly, if you have one sandwich or you have a bit too much fruit, it can knock you out of ketosis. So, and I, I seem to be uh, very resistant to developing ketones, but I really do believe ketones are very healthy for the brain and the heart and other uh, organs. Uh, in particular, I think it's uh, very important for brain functioning because the brain operates really well off of ketones and sugar. Um, glucose. So I do believe that there's a place for exogenous ketones in our life. Right. Um, even, Absolutely. And it makes it a lot more efficient for us because you don't have to go so extreme to cut out all carbohydrates and hope to stay in ketosis. I do think the supplementation of the ketones, even if you don't feel anything from the exogenous ketones, um, I do think it's very helpful for, especially for brain functioning. Yeah. I've taken, I've had exogenous ketones. I know how they impact my brain. Um, and so there are lots of different people out there. You know, they have different experiences, but I absolutely agree. Brain health and the studies with the, you know, with MCT fat and all this that, that's happening today is just, it's really unbelievable. Yeah, there's a lot of great work on Alzheimer's disease, uh, mild cognitive impairment um, with giving people the exogenous ketones. And I, I think there's a future there in the research because, we know that Alzheimer's is now, which is called type three diabetes. Yeah. Um, it appears in Alzheimer's, you've got cells that can actually use glucose as well as ketones. Stephen Kinane has done some wonderful research in this area. Um, and what you find is it's reduced ability to use glucose in people with Alzheimer's disease, but these same cells can use ketones for energy. Um, but for most of us, our cells aren't gonna see ketones because we, don't, we have basically a standard Western diet. Right. <laughs> I do think there's a place either for the ketogenic diet alone or in mm -hmm. supplementing the diet with the exogenous ketones, especially for ideal brain health. Right. 
and and to get back into ketosis if for whatever reason you you know were on the ketogenic diet and then got kicked out so you know there are, there's a lot of research that's happening now um so if anybody wants more information on that you know we're i'm going to post a few links but what i wanted to do right now um david is would you mind answering a question or two if anybody because there are people out there watching i sure. i see you guys all commenting and we couldn't say you know, we were deep in conversation. So anybody out there watching, if you have a question, post it now, okay? And then um, we'll go ahead and, and give it to David and, and see what's, uh, you know, okay. what comes. Okay, I've see, uh, come on everyone. I know you guys are out there watching, so question. Maybe everything was so clear, there's no need for questions. Oh, I know. You, you were very clear, thank, David. Thank you so much. It, it really was. Um, well, I have a question. Aside from, oh, we're going to wait until I get somebody. From, there, everybody's being shy, but there are a lot of people watching. Um, what is your favorite low carb recipe? Oh, meal. Um, actually, I have to tell you, my wife makes a spectacular chicken dish. Um, in which she has the chicken and bakes it in both coconut oil and butter, and then uh, grills some mozzarella on top, and along with it some um, broccoli, along with sautéed and butter. Uh, to me, that's just—it's an absolutely magnificent meal. That sounds delicious. <laughs> uh, so maybe if your wife wants to share it with us, or share it with you, and you could share it with us, that would be great. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just going to say thank you so much for spending this time with us. And uh, I'm going to post a couple of links to um, Dr. Diamond's YouTube chat or YouTube video about um, heart health and diet myths and any information, you know, the USF info page. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and send them and maybe... Uh, Dr. Diamond, if you would agree to, you know, answer one or two, if we can message them to you later, because I know during the day is a tough time and people have been coming in and out. Um, um, if there's a question that's really, uh, you know, just intriguing, maybe you'll, you'll uh, take time to look at it. Sure, but I just, I appreciate it. And thank, thank you so much and hope to see you out there. Um, and then, and maybe you'll come out with a book too. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks again for inviting me. You're so welcome. Bye-bye. All right, bye everyone. And the and meeting.